Hi, everybody. Welcome to the keynote reading for Saturday the, on the second weekend of Culturama. We've got two more weekends after this, and we've got all, all of tomorrow as well. Uh, today, we've got um, a, a great panel. It's, it's writers of color talk about the difficulties in being employed, basically. Um, if you'd like to see uh, any of these, we are recording as many as we can, as long as there's not violations of privacy, that sort of thing. Somebody's writing something about some some things that they've gone through. We don't want to we don't want to put that on the internet. But if you want to go to it, you can go to it here at our community, our Culturana community blog spot here, and we've put up several of these these uh, of our things up. We're going to keep Culturama going all year long, and so th this will be the place to interact with us. So. Um, uh, I, I didn't get the whole emailer. I'll, I'll put the I'll put the um, the whole um, HTTP address address down there, and you'll be able to to sign up sign up for this. But right now we have five really gr great artists, poets, and writers. We have Luis Mendoza Padilla, Ron, Ronald Husband, uh, Matt Sadio, Ishan Lai, and Shonda Buchanan here. And they're gonna they're gonna talk about we're gonna ask some questions. I, I've got some some questions that Lloyd gave me to, to warm us up. But anytime you want to jump in with questions, or if you um, at the end if you want to ask questions, we'd we'd love that. That's really why why we're here. So I'm just gonna ask you to introduce yourselves one at a time. And I'm just going left to right, top to bottom on my my screen. Uh, Luis Padilla is is first for me. So if you could introduce yourself, Luis. Oh, uh, well, hi everyone, and thank you to Cool Trauma, everyone that is making this event happening. Um, it is really beneficial for everyone that wants to know more about like the people and the things that they do. So it's really, it's really inspirational to be here. And uh, well, yeah, um, my name is Luis Mendoza Padilla. Um, I'm still a Mount Sex student. I took some classes with Ron Husband. Uh, he used to get mad at me because I used to be sometimes late. <laughs> but hey, I passed my class with an A, so that was good. Um, uh, I'm a I'm an animator, illustrator, and as for right now, kind of like not directing, but doing a project that it's going to get into a competition on Mexico. Um, and yeah, basically, most of my art is based on a different way of looking to Mexico instead of the stereotypical ways of looking at it, like Day of the Dead and all that stuff. It's kind of like the more urban urban way to look at Mexico, and I believe like that's part of like that makes me not different but uh i'll say yeah different to to uh, most of the uh, stereo, stereo, um, stereotypical art on mexico so yeah that's a little bit about me <laughs> okay great and how about uh, ronald husband uh, good morning all right good, morning. good afternoon everyone um she was this is probably um my fifth or sixth year of participating in culturama so i've uh, had an opportunity to be a part of this for a number of years. Um, my name, oh. <laughs> I, I retired. I worked at Disney Studios for 38 years. I was an animator. You've seen Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Aladdin. I worked on all those uh, pictures plus more. <laughs> and uh, written a book uh, on, on quick sketching. I also uh, illustrated a book, uh, doing freelance, uh, animation, excuse me, freelance uh, illustration for books and magazines, um, as well as the, my own um, personal pen and ink work. And I'm teaching at Mount Sac uh, over at uh, Art Center a couple of days a week. So keep busy in my retirement. Okay, and Matt Cedillo. Oh uh, yeah, uh, hi, I'm Matt Cedillo, um, writer, uh, poet. Um, I think this is the third or fourth year um, I've uh, participated in uh, Culturama, maybe uh, it's, it's been a few years um, and uh, back when it was Writers Weekend as well. So I really appreciate uh, the whole cultural and my team. Uh, thank you, John, and, uh, and your whole team for, uh, for inviting me again this year. So I really appreciate that. Um, most recently, I wrote this book here, Mowing Leaves of Grass. Uh, and um, I guess that's the most recent thing. And so, uh, yeah, I'm the literary director of the Dawson for the Arts. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And if, if anybody's interested in and in continuing writing, writing, um, he does great things. At the Da, which is downtown Pomona, uh, check check that out. Um, and Ishan. Hey, everybody. I'm Ishan Lai. Nice to meet you. Um, I write both fiction and nonfiction. Most recently, 
Pinups, which is the Culturama book club first read that's coming up soon, right, John? Yeah. Um, super excited to discuss all of that with you all when the time comes. Um, let's see, I am also a founding editor at Undomesticated, which is a web publication that looks to redefine travel writing. We just launched October 8th. It's a COVID launch. Woohoo! <laughs> really exciting. Um, and I'm also a columnist at the Writer Magazine, where I have a monthly column that's all about the art of publishing and the craft of writing. Um, I teach in the MFA programs at Bay Path and Southern New Hampshire Universities. Thanks so much for having me. I love this every single year, and I think it's so cool that it's so way more accessible to this time around to people across the nation. So really excited to see this go on. And Shada Buchanan. Hi everyone, I'm Shonda Buchanan. I taught at Monk Sack for, oh my gosh, I don't know, three years. So I miss everybody. <laughs> I miss all the students there. Um, one of my favorite populations. I currently teach at LMU. I'm in the AFAM department, the African American uh, Studies department, uh, teaching Black cultural arts. And what an interesting time to be teaching Black cultural arts in the time of Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm also an author, so I'm the author of this memoir, um, Black Indian. I talk about the, and I think John's class is uh, reading this, yeah. So I talk about the intersections of what it means to be bi-ethnic and biracial, uh, and also kind of growing up in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, in a really, really lovely, loud family, <laughs> really interesting family. Um, I'm also the author of uh, Who's Afraid of Black Indians? which my audiobook is coming out um, from a Bantu book, so I'm pretty excited. And Who's Afraid of Black Indians is a collection of poetry. And this is actually the beginning or the integer of um, my memoir. Um, and uh, I'm a, a digital content producer as well for a, um, a media outlet and um, working on a couple of other projects. I have a book about Nina Simone, a collection of poetry about Nina Simone. I'm working on a second memoir. Uh, just lots of writing happening right now. So I'm really grateful to be able to be here and to, um, you know, to share with Culturama. Thank you, John, and everybody who's involved. And I'm also the keynote uh, next Saturday as well. So my keynote talk is next Saturday at 5 p.m. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. So I'm going to start off with some questions. Uh, but if any questions um, occur to any of you, please jump in. I'm going to start off with this. Uh, as an artist of color, what is the accomplishment you're most proud of? And just anybody uh, of the five, please answer. For me, it was figuring out that I was an artist of color. Um, I think, I think as a as a model minority growing up here in Southern California, you kind of believe that you can be white, um, and that it's the best thing to be, right? Uh, you know, don't rock the boat, and also just be quiet and do your thing kind of seeps in on a really cellular level. Um, so, you know, it wasn't until I started pitching my, my novel that I realized, which was, by the way, was published in 2016. So 2013, I started pushing, pitching it and it was like, oh, this is going to have to be an Asian American book. Oh, that's because publishing is mostly white. Oh, they're not gonna let me get by with being, you know, just a great writer, right? So um, it was a pretty big step for me and a pretty recent step for me. And I, I guess I could say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person who's recovering from wanting to be white, I suppose. <laughs> so I'm getting there, but it is, uh, it's, it's definitely something I think about a lot and uh, have been working towards, so. I love that you're recovering from wanting to be white. That is awesome. <laughs> it's a lifelong work, Shonda, let me tell you. <laughs> 12, step. 12 step recovery period. Um, that's such a hard question in terms of like, what am I most proud of as a writer of color? Um, I think, I think maybe, I, I guess I could say both of the books that I just showed, like the, my memoir, Black Indian, I'm incredibly proud of it because and it, it's not just a personal story or memoir. It's, for me, it's the story of America. It's kind of a tapestry of um, how, how, how races have laid on top of each other or um, you know, made relations and community and, um, I, I mean, just everything from, you know, being mulattoized or, you know, being a mixed blood person and, uh, and then also talking about, you know, some of the, the ways that legally we, you know, mixed blood people were, you know, um, illegitimized, you know, we were considered immoral, uh, you know, tithed you know, when we went into a state because we weren't, you know, we were free people of color, so we weren't white. And so we had to pay taxes on ourselves to go into certain states. I mean, 
So I think I'm most proud of Black Indian because it really deals with that, um, the intersections of race and ethnicity and uh, culture, and then also selfhood, you know, what it means to be an American. So I'm, I'm most proud of that, I think. I can go. Okay. Yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, well, for me, uh, one thing that I really like feel proud. It's about when people tell me like, I I didn't knew that was Mexican. When they tell me that, when they see my my work, and I believe that's one of like the the proudest thing that I get when I create something. Uh, because when they when I told people like, oh, I draw like about Mexican culture, they straight up just go for like things that they've seen on TV and stuff like that. And when they go and see it, they get this feeling of like, I didn't knew that was Mexican as well. I mean, it looks good, but I didn't know that was part of like, also um, they, they, they were so used to see a part of the Mexican culture and be with my art, it's, it's uh, kind of like opening those gates to like what it truly means to be different in the same society of Mexicans as well. So I believe like that's one of the things that I really feel proud of like doing with my art and as a colored artist, a, a, I mean, uh, an artist of color, so yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll chime in, uh, I'm sort of like uh, Shonda, uh, and this is a hard question, but uh, you know, I look at um, you know the, the, the greatest accomplishment product of, it's something down the road, you know, something I'm shooting for that I can, um, some, so somewhere down the road, you know, that'll be the, you know, I'll stick my chest out and say, yeah, that's it. You know, but I'm still pushing for that, man. I'm still pushing for it. Uh, I think that, you know, when we talk about this question of a, a writer of color, I think that it's really important to remember that, you know, the, the world, people come from like distinct groups of people and like there are certain stereotypes that are associated with that group of people, right? So I'm of Mexican descent, but I was born in the United States. So I'm a Mexican American, Chicano. Yeah. And um, for, for that, it, it seems like, you know, um, a lot of stereotypes that, that, that are associated with, 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 with that is being very hardworking, doing like, you know, being, you know, really like kind of tough and this and that. Um, but intelligence is not, intelligence is not something that is, that, that people associate with that experience. So every, every, Every venture I've gone through, every time I, I've stood up to, to do something, to write something, to be a speaker somewhere, I've spoken to over 100 colleges, and I've been asked if I was a custodial staff many times. I've been asked if I was custodial staff wearing a, a sports coat, like wearing a, like a wearing like a like a, a, a suit, right? And so, like, yeah, that that, that I came here to, to clean the floor, dressed in a suit, right? That makes sense. Um, I've been um, I've been I've been having a, a police officer almost shoot me when I was trying to get my check, you know? So I mean, this this is this is things that have happened from a college on a, on a college campus. And so these are things that happened to me. Um, and these are things I've experienced. Um, so I think that a lot of everything I do, every, every stage I do something, there's always like this weird, like vengeance narrative associated with it. Like I showed you, I showed you, I showed you. So I don't ever get proud. I get very just like angry. Um, every time something good happens for me, I get very angry and very depressed. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't linger in it. I just move forward, I just move forward, I just move forward, I just move forward, I just move forward. And I ended up looking at things like trophies. I ended up looking at those tools. Now this serves me and it also, it's, it's a sad life, but it's also like a productive life. I mean, so I don't ever get hung up when something good happens. I just like look at it as a tool. I look at it as a hammer, not a trophy to put on a mantle. Um, so I guess recently with the, with the publication of the book, you know, there's a, a I, I try to get, you know, reviews and I couldn't really, it's very, a lot of very struggle to get some more like a typical poetry type, you know, um, Things pick it up, but I, I'm very, you know, was big in the left sources, right? So I got it, I got an article in Counterpunch, right? And so the count and Counterpunch said the guy in Counterpunch uh, compared me to Brecht and to Dalton, right? Roque Dalton and, uh, and and Bertolt Brecht, right? So there it is in this this, this magazine that has hundreds of thousands of, of of you know subscriptions and circulation. I'm being compared to Brecht and Dalton. Great, moving forward, right? Um, I got it in Roar magazine, also another big one, saying the book's a masterpiece. Okay. Roar Magazine, hundreds of thousands, it's from the UK, great, masterpiece, it's in print, excellent, moving forward. It doesn't mean anything outside of, of what it says there. I just, just keep moving forward. Because if I sit down and like really think about it, I'm going to start thinking about all the, 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 the insults and all the, 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 just the, the, the things that have come along the way, and I'm just going to get mad. So like for me, 
I, I just got to keep moving forward. I just got to keep moving forward. And, uh, and, uh, and one day uh, it'll all be over and uh, hopefully I will have done enough to be talked about for centuries after I'm dead. And that's just, and, and there's nothing else than that. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, do, do, do you have any uh, uh, role models uh, as you were coming up? And if you didn't, what, what was that experience like? Maybe we start with the Asian. Uh, oh, go, okay. maybe start with Luis. Oh, I can, I can go. I mean, please, whoever please. wants to. Go. All right. Well, I believe like there's so many people that I admire. Uh, and it's mostly because of their story of how they got to like where they got to be. Uh, when I was uh, when I was taking the 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 class with, I mean, not to like brag about it or anything, but I was when I was taking uh, Run Husband, I believe like during lunch I used to talk with him, and he would like tell me some stories, and we were able to, I mean, to celebrate kind with him with like when he retired. So that was pretty cool. Uh, that was kind of like inspiration that I got uh, with my professors. I believe some, the majority of my professors, Melissa Macias, she just uh, amazing of like how she inspired me to keep going when I was going to like a really rough time during my college experience, my first years as a college student. But as a high figures, like I'll see, I see like Jorge Gutierrez, which is like one of the top animators right now, having a show on Netflix and all that. Uh, in Mexico, uh, Mexican directors are barely coming out that I was able to interview um, Marvin Nunez. He's one of like the, he, um, he's always sending me messages about like how I am and stuff like that. And I really like those, those stories of like how they had to crawl through mud in order to get out of the surface and be able to show their stories and all that. Like those are were my role models. So as right now, I can count those but I have so many that I could go on and on and on and on and on. But as for right now, those are my main four. Uh, but yeah, I really like, as for right now, I can say that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Ronald, did you have any uh, role models coming up? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, as far as um, artists, uh, Black artists, uh, artists of color, uh, there was... You know, growing in primarily you know, black community, Monrovia, California, which was pretty well uh, segregated at the time. Um, but you know, my, just uh, no, there was no one that um, you know, I had seen as a as an artist, particularly black artist. Um, you know, so there was no nobody to like um, uh, identify with. Uh, it wasn't until you know later on that you know I I got to doing some research and, and looking at, uh, you know, Charles White and, you know, um, Augusta Savage, you know, and doing some, and there was some a really a strong um, um, black artists through, throughout the, the ages, you know, um, but like I said, growing up, I had, you know, no one, uh, uh, there was nothing uh, there, um, particularly, like I said, in the black community, I mean, I'm looking at, um, uh, people whose houses, you know, are filled with art on the walls. You know, I mean, just it just wasn't a, a thing that uh, I grew up with. Uh, and I said it, it, it would take a, a while uh, before I uh, got a chance to um, to investigate and find out. You know, like I said, the wealth of, of, uh, of black uh, art, art. Uh, you know, not only uh, graphic art, but uh, you know, poetry, writers, etc. Uh, but um, uh, you know, I, I was invited to South Africa to the um, South African um, Film Festival or uh, Animation Festival, and uh, one of the in the uh, invitation letter, you know, they were uh, was saying, you know, it was important that I come because you can't be what you can't see, you know, and that was uh, uh, you know, really resonated with me in the sense of um, you know they they want someone to identify with. Because uh, again, you know, coming up, there was uh, nothing like that. Even uh, even in animation, uh, you know, there were no. Um, I didn't, well, going to Disney. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about animation in the first place. But little, little did I know from 
1937 with Snow White till 1975 where I got there that there hadn't been no animators, no black animators, literally, uh, through that period. And I, and I literally was the first black animator at Disney and the first black supervising animator at Disney. Um, and they had been making pictures for over 40 years, you know, and, and, but I, you know, I had not known that, but, um, you know, there, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of rich history in, um, in, in art um, that like I said, I, it, it, you know, um, being an um, uh, opportunity to like open my eyes and really uh, investigate and see uh, what's behind this, what has been behind the scenes and, and that's built up. Okay, great. What, what about the, uh, some other people, did you have role models? Yeah, you can. Um, I think for me, uh, I'm actually still thinking a lot about what Matt said, you know, the sort of like keeping on, keeping on and consistently moving forward. Um, and in thinking about that in terms of like the culture that I grew up in, right, which which was very much colonial lag Taiwanese, right, where it was like my parents moved here in 1978 and they still expected um, us to be, you know, quiet Taiwanese family, right? So the, the people that I looked, that I was told to, be, to, to look at as role models weren't people that I particularly respected, right? It was like, oh, I, I distinctly remember my dad opening up the LA Times and, or maybe it was my mom, showing me this, this huge, huge article about this girl who was Vietnamese and she was really, really um, a, a traditional, you know, like she would cook all the meals and serve her father first and stand behind, behind her chair, his chair while he, while he ate kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, wait for everybody to, to finish their meals before she sat down to, to eat herself um, and still got straight A's, right? And my parents were like, oh, you know, can't you be just like this girl? Can't you be just like this girl? Um, and that was really frustrating to me because I really didn't want to be like that girl, right? And if, so, you know, it's kind of interesting because being proud of yourself and being satisfied with, with what you've done is like verboten in my culture. You know, you, you just don't do it for a lot of different reasons. Um, and, and yet the people that I was presented with to be role models weren't up to my particular standards, right? They weren't doing the things that, that, I, that I wanted to do. Um, in fact, the first time that I can remember being admiring of anybody is watching an episode of Bewitched and seeing Darren, um, go to work and create all those really cool advertising campaigns, <laughs> the, the marketing campaigns. And I thought to myself, I, I think I kind of want to be like Darren. <laughs> like, I want to, you know, go to work with a briefcase and like make really beautiful visual advertising campaigns that make people buy things type thing, you know? And I, I thought that was really interesting that it's a, it's the first thing that I can think of when it comes to role models. But I yeah, certainly didn't look for people who looked like me because I didn't know they existed. You know, I thought, I thought all literature starred you know, children who said, I, I'd rather do this mommy a lot, you know, and had peachy skin and, and, and rosy cheeks and blue eyes. And um, I, I didn't understand that, that, that you could be like me and, and, you know, write stories that didn't star children who were of that complexion. So um, growing up without a role model is, or at least growing up with a role model who, who doesn't look like you is pretty interesting. That's gonna require some more unpacking. So thanks for that, John. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about following up with what, what is the importance of the role model? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think um, for, for role models, I mean, there's like role models. I mean, there's kind of a role model. I mean, that, it's kind of almost a fine role model, right? Uh, you know, like uh, just about just like general idea, right? Like, I think that like, you know, there's people that spoke to me that weren't necessarily the same ethnicity, like, like, like uh, some like Malcolm X, like by any means necessary. Or like, I mean, you know, reading that as a kid, and like, or like um, Bruce Lee, you know, and like Enter the Dragon. He says like, "You offended me. You offended my family. You offended the Shaolin Temple." Right, and then proceeds to beat this guy senseless. Right, that 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 that, that defiance that 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 that, that defiance against that. You know, um, you know, come from my own culture. Obviously, like the figure of Emiliano Zapata, better to die on your feet than live on your knees. Right, so that's, that's always like kind of in the background of my mind. These, these kind of like the, you know, the spirit of defiance, um, I think is kind of universal. But I mean, so like that kind of, that kind of, that kind of spirit is something I've always wanted. Like I felt it. And then like, as I started writing, it became kind of really, really what I wanted to convey. Like that, I wanted to convey that kind of, that, that kind of defiant spirit. And that became, that's not the totality of me. I mean, I think a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of ideas run through my mind, but I thought of like, what is the most important thing I can say? And what is the thing I'm good at saying? Uh, it was that. And so I decided to like channel it into that. So my writing is really isn't just the service of how I feel about myself or what I feel about the world. It's really trying to embody a certain kind of spirit because I think that that, that, that 
it's, the world needs more of it, right? So that was kind of kind of how, what I poured myself into. And, and I think that there's that. Now, as far as like someone like a role model, like, you know, like, hey, Matt, you're, you can be successful. And look at me, I'm successful. Um, you, can, you, can, you can live out your dreams as I've lived out mine. Um, this is possible for you. Um, that's uh, that kind of hands-on experience. Yeah, I definitely had that. And it, I'd be remiss not to talk about him. Um, you know, I've been, I've been very, very fortunate, very, very, just incredibly fortunate uh, to come under um, uh, the mentorship or the just the, the guiding hand or helping hand, I don't know, hand up uh, from Luis Rodriguez. Um, you know, this last year, me and him went to Cuba together and we spoke at Casa Las Americas. I mean, at a, at a conference in Havana. I mean, that was incredible. Um, and so like, that was, you know, something like that, but that, 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 that journey began years and years ago when, uh, you know, I was sitting down with Denny's and he told me like, here's how I became successful. You too can blah, 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 blah. And I'm just, at this point in time, I'm like a feature at an open mic. You know, this is like back in like 2000 and maybe 12 or something like that. This is me. Like I, I just, I made a slam team, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that, that's it. You know, I have a chat book or something. And he was telling me that like, you too can blah, 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 blah. And you fast forward a few years after that, and I think it was maybe around 2015. Well, I don't remember. When was uh, the American Writers uh, AWP or whatever, AW, whatever it's called? Yeah, AWP. AWP. When was it in LA? Wasn't that 2015? Okay, 2015. Uh, at an offsite over at Avenue 50, there's this big thing, and then he's getting an award. And he says something that we Chicanos are seen as a bunch of crabs in a bucket that we're always pulling each other down, but that's not true. Uh, Juan Felipe Herrera helped me. Um, uh, Sandra Cisneros helped me and uh, I'm working with a young man in the audience that man's Matt Cedillo right and so like says it's hundreds of people in the audience and he's saying this in front of all of them right now I don't think of this I'm not saying this to shine apples I'm not saying it's a brag I'm not saying any of that right I'm not even proud of it it was more like that was a certain amount of pressure that was now on me to like try and like okay now I gotta do that now right and so like um, but because he said that uh, I could begin to envision a world where bigger things would happen for me than, than just, than just uh, having a book and just uh, being invited to speak at a college here and there, that I would be able to do things um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, you know, that I would be able to go down the road of, of, of trying to, to establish myself in that kind of way. And I'm still very, very far from it, but like, but I, but the idea that, that I can do it and the fact that it's possible that if I keep doing it, you know, three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, I'm going to be ahead of wherever I was. Um, really kind of, I, I can't credit anybody but Luis for that. I mean, that, that was really the, the idea that like, um, that just because I'm not where you're at now doesn't mean I can't be there one day. Um, uh, I really got that from Luis. Let me follow up just a little bit with you, Matt. Um, is, there, is there anything that we all can do for writers coming up that Luis had done for you, especially writers of color? Yeah, I mean, you could. I mean, the, the, the thing that like a lot of the, a lot of the ability to do a lot of things is, is somewhat in, in, internal uh, to me. Just like the idea that like, okay, well, you told me something, now I'm gonna like map it out and structure it and figure it out. Um, but it was it was just that he encouraged me. I mean, the very encouragement he told me that that you know where you are now is not necessarily where you're gonna be, right? Like, so I think that if 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 writers of anybody, I mean, like this is just writers close to anybody, right? Like, if you see something you admire. Like you really should embrace the concept that there are levels to things. And that does not mean that like there's levels and, you know, know your place. No, no, no. It just means like know where you're at so that you can know you can take the practical steps to get to the next place. And from this next place, now you can take the practical steps to get here. From which point you can take the practical steps to get here. So you can take the practical steps to get here, the practical steps to get here, the practical steps to get here. Um, and that, that that's something that you should really like embrace and, and, and really look at it mechanically and, and not be so... Um, not be, to really understand the mechanics of it, to study it, to know why and how and, 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 and that. And then moving away from, from just Luis, I'm just my own advice, which is like, you know, develop your style, turn your style into a standard of excellence, turn your style, to develop your style into a discipline, turn your discipline into a standard of excellence that you hold yourself to every time. Because if you have your own standard of excellence, then nobody can discredit you. Nobody can build you up. Nobody can tear you down. You know why you're excellent. And why you're excellent should never be a mystery uh, to yourself. It can be a mystery to the audience. Maybe it should be a mystery to the audience, but it should never be a mystery to you. Um, and so I think that, that, that would be my, my, my biggest piece of advice. Like, you know, you know, be you and be great at being you. Um, cause, uh, you know, I, I'm really inspired by a lot of things that, that Luis is saying, uh, uh, Luis Padilla over here is saying, because, you know, like he's talking about, you know, widening the, 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 the span of, 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 of people's conceptions of, of what it means to be Mexican or what Mexico means 
beyond like you know some pyramids and a bandolier and you know <laughs> Dios Muertos and um and you know you know just I mean even, even things that aren't like embarrassing or debasing even things that are cool and interesting but it's the same thing every time you know like you know expanding beyond that I mean that, that that's really that's that's really important work that's really have an expansive view to have something that's unique and 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 it's also just like it's 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 real and it's not just you're not creating this art that can be immediately consumed by somebody who doesn't even know the topic you know like uh, I think that's I think that's uh, really important um, what he's doing and I I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm going, going to drift right now but but as far as what Luis did for me and what, what we can do for others is really that we should really always be uh, invested in in you know in, in the future generations and and be part of something bigger than yourself. You know, by you yourself being a part of something bigger than yourself, you're invested in being a link in a chain uh, to something that is more than just your own vanity, you know? And so that will make you invested in, 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 in making sure that the generation behind you comes up, that, that, you, that, that the message that you are conveying to the world is, is, is recreated or replicated in a different generational way. But it has, a, you know, it's, it's a legacy. Just as something preceded you, something will, will come after you. And, and being a part of ushering that in um, is, is kind of responsibility. Great. Um, and uh, Shonda, I wonder if you could talk about uh, role models as well. Yeah, I, listening to everyone, I, I did the gamut. As soon as I'm last, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a role model. So, so I've got posthumous role models. I've got role models where um, the first one that came to mind was Charlene Rollins. She put together this anthology in 1968. It was published in 1968 by um, Noth, and uh, it was called I Am the Darker Brother. And it included uh, everyone from Langston Hughes, Marie Evans, um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, Amiri Baraka, who was Leroy Jones then. And so just a lot of just, you know, Black um, Harlem Renaissance artists, uh, Black arts movement poets. But I say she was the, um, my hero or she wrote because she was basically a librarian who wanted to promote the black voice and how how could she do this and she was like i need to pull together like a cod like a group a cadre a phalanx i need to pull this together and then see who can publish it and so that's how that book i am a darker brother came about and i actually have that first like i have a 1968 edition which i accidentally stole from my cousin who checked it out from the lansing michigan library i never told him that i stole it so maybe he just knows um, but she's just a role model for me, I think, because, um, you know, I've always wanted to be someone who galvanized young writers. I wanted to be someone who, um, you know, who, who writers, people who were trying to find their writing voice could, you know, kind of, you know, maybe even um, look up to or look to as a resource, you know, as, you know, so how do I, um, how do I do this? And where do I go for this? And who are the people, you know, that I should, you um, that I should talk to about this. So she was my first one. She, I was introduced to her when I was 11. But then I've met people along the way. And I'm just going to list off a couple of folks who are just pretty amazing uh, and incredibly supportive. Luis Rodriguez is, you know, one of my, like, dear friends, incredibly supportive. He gave me that sit down talk to <laughs> at an AWP. Um, Ethelbert Miller in, um, in DC. He's the unofficial poet laureate. Just, um, a uh, prolific, you know, man. Ethelbert Miller is uh, has always been encouraging. Jeff Allen. I mean, these are the kinds of folks who will not only look at your writing and help you craft your poetry, uh, or your fiction, or your narrative nonfiction, um, but you know, they'll say, "Hey, you know what? I, there's a reading, or there's an event, or there's a panel, and I thought you'd be good for it. So let me put you in contact with this person." So there's a lot of like putting on, you know. Um, Jess uh, Taimba Jess is like that as well. Taimba Jess is a um, Pulitzer Prize winner for Olio and um, and also for, um, oh my gosh, Jeff, sorry, Jess, I'm forgetting your other book. Okay, so those are my like kind of literary um, folks. I've got tons, Toni Morrison, W. Garcia Marquez. I mean, I've got so many who have created, helped me create my writing voice. But I also want to say, so as I was thinking, the other people who are my heroes are Breonna Taylor. Um, you know, Breonna Taylor was a uh, shot in her um, in her bed and um, you know we all well I, I'm assuming that we all know the story of Brianna Taylor um, but just we'll, I'll just say for um, the sake of this you know a black woman who gave her life unintentionally so that um, you know we could highlight an uh, institutional systematic ill you know in our country uh, some other women who are my heroes Latasha Harlan uh, Latasha Harlan was shot you know by a Korean store owner in South Central LA, 
uh, the Korean store owner thought she had a, um, that she was about to, supposedly that she was about to steal, steal some orange juice and she had put it in her bag because she didn't have, she put it in her backpack, but she had her money out, but she um, didn't have, apparently she just needed to have her hands to get her money. And the, you can, you can Google, I mean, it's a terrible thing to be able to Google, but the Korean store owner shot her. And so Latasha Harlan became just kind of another reason that um, uh, the, the Rodney King riots, you know, just kind of erupted and happened. Um, you know, so there are just so many uh, fallen heroes and sheroes um, that I write for. I'll say it like that. And I love how Matt, you know, you're talking about, and, and Luis, you guys are talking about expanding like, you know, the concepts so of the idea of what it means to be an artist, you know, or, or making people, um, you know, work harder to get at the art. And I think as a, as a poet and a writer, you know, my job, it, um, and I think Sonia Sanchez is somebody else who also is just like a woman, who, a poet who cracks open literature, you know, with, it, and, and makes it like a tactile thing. And so I think a part of being a writer is making people work at the things that uh, can make us better as a, as a human being, um, you know, and uh, can, um, you know, make us, um, you know, do something to contribute to, to this world, to this society. So for me, writing is a utilitarian thing. Writing is a tool, uh, you know, with which to, um, to grow myself and others. I have many more, um, many more heroes and sheroes and uh, Joy Harjo. Uh, I have to say is just uh, just an amazing person, uh, our current poet laureate, uh, Muskogee Creek woman. And, uh, you know, she was one of the first people to encourage me to, to write Black Indian. And, you know, we had dinner um, before this was even a concept, before my, my um, Who's Afraid of Black Indians? And she said, just write your own truth, you know, write your own story. And it was like, it, it, you know, it was like permission, you know, to kind of tell that story of what it means to be somebody who was African American in this, um, in, in America, but also who had have, you know, indigenous blood and indigenous, indigenous ancestry, um, which I researched. So yeah, along the way, my heroes, I've, I've just, I'm not going to say changed, but I've needed certain heroes, depending on what I was working with, and depending on what I was going through um, in my personal and professional life. So, um, yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And, and maybe I should write an essay about that. Yeah. Hey, John, can yeah. I, can I weigh in on, on, um, the question that you asked earlier about what we can do for other, for other folks and other writers of color in particular, um, artists of color, really. Right. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, um, and it ties a little bit into, to what Matt and Luis were saying earlier about helping people to see other, other views of Mexico, right? And um, I was listening to the poet Nate Marshall talk. He wrote Finna, which is just out recently. Um, and it, what he was saying is that he thought that a lot of the problems we have in these United States now uh, come down to a lack of imagination, right? Um, white cops have a lack of imagination when it comes to seeing young black men doing things that they're not supposed to be doing, right? Um, and uh, I think that part of this broadening of people's awareness has to do with uh, allowing them to broaden their imaginations, right? Which is part of the work that, that Luis is doing and part of the work that we all are doing here. But it also really comes down to making stories that are other or exotic normal, right? So, you know, if we're, we're in a situation where we can consistently say, um, yeah, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm reading a story about a young black man, and I can stop saying things like, "Oh my gosh, isn't it horrible that this happened to him?" You know, it's like this is the part of America, right? It's part of what happens every single day. Um, if I can tell the story about how my fencing instructor used to call me his Asian dream, you know, and people can stop saying, "Oh my God, that's horrible." Well, it happens every day, you know. So it's like this is one of those things where we have to just start getting used to. Um, used to the everyday systemic stuff that, that, that a racism, right, that underscores our lives and girds all of our systems. And if we can get that to the point where it's normal, then that also encompasses broadening people's imaginations and allowing them to not be shocked by these things that they're hearing, right? Um, so I think that that's one thing that, that we can do. And, uh, you know, part of that also, it, it goes for all marginalized stories, right? It's not just writers of color, artists of color, it's, it's writers who are LGBTQIA or writers who are disabled, you know? So there are all these things that we have to look at. And I think a 
huge part of that is that rising tide lifts all boats narrative, which I which I really buy into. So when I think about lifting writers of color, I also think about lifting people who who just don't have the same advantages as the majority does or the majority of people in power, right? Um, and then the second thing that I think is super important for us to do is to demystify the progress, the, the process by which literature and art happens in this world. I am so tired of MFA programs pumping out students with and letting them graduate with no idea of how to make money back. It is criminal, you know, and I'm not like, seriously, it, it just, uh, it's still, John, you've seen me talk about this like hundreds and hundreds of times and I still am perpetually pissed off by it, right? Because it's kind of like, okay, when and when when you graduate these MFA students, by the way, you should probably also buy them a fainting couch, all right? Because that's the narrative you're feeding them. Yes, you know, you're going to go off and you're going to craft your, your work in your garret or your attic or whatever, and eventually you'll get consumption and nobody will pay for it. But that's okay because your work will be published posthumously and everybody will know who you are, right? I mean, that, that's, that's it's not the way to work, right? Writing deserves money, period. All art deserves money. That is just the bottom line. You know, you're carving open your heart, giving them a piece of your bleeding soul. And they're like, that's great. I'm going to take that for free. And by the way, our literary magazine is digital. So you don't even get a free copy. Uh-uh. No, that does not happen in this house, you know? So, okay. I'm, I'm all heated up now. So I just, you know, we need to demystify that process. We have to make sure that every single student that comes into a creative writing class understands how to make money off of it because money makes the world go around right now, you know, and that's, that's just the way it is. I want to weigh in on this. I want to weigh in on the MFA program itself and writers of color. So something that Claudine Rankin said several years ago when she was at the keynote here in LA at AWP, and she did this beautiful kind of treaties when she, she did her keynote and she was talking about how MFA programs and the professors who teach MFA programs relegate students of color to second class citizens in their classrooms. And then also the other thing that happens in the, in the MFA program is where when a writer of color brings their precious baby writing to the class and it's confront quote unquote confrontational. But for us, the normalize is I've experienced racism in America and this is what it looks like. And then for the professor who is not of color and they're like, I don't know if that's valid. <laughs> it's like, but it's my valid experience, but it makes me feel bad. The white professor says, and it's like, so the, so, Claudia said, and, and this is like an experience that she gave voice, she articulated for many of us, is that the, the MFA, MFA program teacher becomes the victim. And, and then it pushes us out and it makes us doubt ourselves and it makes us put our writing aside. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe I'm writing too hard or maybe, I'm, maybe, maybe that my voice is not authentic. I've had so many of my friends come to me and they're like, well, this professor said this to me and I think I'm just gonna, I'm just going to just write essays or become a medical, like, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm just going to do medical, you know, stuff on, on, from the phone. So one piece of advice that I would love to give young writers of color is do not let someone in an MFA program or any, any professor in any classroom tell you that your voice is not valid. Let me, let me I, I, and, um, underscore that everything that you are writing is valid your work is to make it accessible and beautiful to you. And, and then also, and this is, this is my piece, is to make it something that connects uh, other people to that experience. But never, never, never let anyone tell you that your voice does not matter and is not valid. Right. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, Matt, I think you have something to add. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, but again, this is why, I mean, uh, given what people are, what people are saying and, and, and uh, um, I mean, I would agree with with, with Shonda. I mean, and and, uh, and Mia. I mean, what we're talking about here is like going back to what I was saying earlier. Like, if you develop your own voice and you have your own standard of excellence, right, that you hold yourself to, like, who cares? Like, I don't. I mean, there are writers I tremendously admire, but if they were to come and tell me like, "Oh man, I really like the poem," I wouldn't care because I know why it's good. I know what it is. I know what I do. It's like, it starts off this way. There's some sad part in the middle. At the end, I'm yelling a bunch of history. I know that. And I do it better than anybody. Nobody can do that as good as me. I'm great at it. Right? I'm the best in the... Matt Cedillo was the best political poet in America. You know, It's on a book that sold thousands of copies. It must be true. You know, <laughs> I don't care. I mean, honestly, honestly, I mean, someone who's like a Nobel Pulitzer Prize, I don't care if you think that I didn't do something right, because I know exactly what I'm doing. 
You know what I'm saying? It's like telling a magician they didn't pull the rabbit out of the hat properly. It's a it's a habit. It's a rabbit. It's a hat. It's it pulled it out. You know, you have to know why what you do is great. You have to know why what you the choices you make, the way you layer things, the way you whatever you build, you got to know why it's you got to first of all. I mean, you have to really pour a lot of time and attention, thought into what you're doing, and then know what those that time and attention thoughts were. So when someone tells you it's not good, it's like, what are you talking about? It's not good. Is it, 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 it's like the engine of a car. It's like a Swiss watch. You know why it's good, you know? And you, so, so you can't have the situation where, where somebody can like validate you or just, uh, I mean, it, it, it's nice to be validated, but you gotta get yourself in a position where like, you're not seeking validation because if you're seeking validation, then you can be discredited, you know? So that you can be invalidated. So that's why it's really, really important. I, I feel to, again, in the order I'd say, you know, develop your style, turn your style into a discipline, turn that discipline into a standard of excellence that you hold yourself to every time. We, we have a question from uh, on the chat room. Um, so what do you as writers and artists of color use besides the traditional literary and artistic apparatus to co connect to your audiences? Um, like the color outside the box or create a new space or how do you do that? If, especially given the idea that, that the MFA is, is really, some ways racist. How, how in the world do you, do you create those those spaces? I'm always I'm a landscape writer, and so I always write from who's occupying that space, you know. So I guess that that for me that's that indigenous, you know. We're in Indian country, you know. Everywhere you throw a rock, that, that's some you know nation's village. So I'm always writing from a place of landscape, and I'm always trying to connect the experiences of the people in that landscape to where I grew up myself, the experiences that I had on that land, and then the experiences of my people who came over, you know, those Africans who came over on the ship. Um, so, so, so what she's asking is how do we make it accessible? That's just where I write from. If Matt, Matt is the greatest pro political writer, yeah, congrats, Matt, I, I appreciate that. You're the greatest political writer of our day. I guess for me, I'm really looking at how, you know, we're all connected because we all embody this space and we occupy this space, but it's just the way in which we occupy that space that causes, you know, a lot of this, this, um, this conflict and systematic racism. So I think for me, my, my, my work is unraveling where those things happen and putting it back together again in my writing. So. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about the question for the artists. Um, that there's a, oh, please, Matt. Oh yeah, to answer the question, I mean like, okay, so how do you get around it? Well, you know, the number one state I've sold uh, uh, books in is California. I'm from California, so that makes sense, right? The number two state is Texas. Hmm. And the number three state is Arizona, right? So, I mean, I don't sell to white people. I don't not sell to white people, but I don't, I don't write for a white audience. Just don't. And I don't mean that in an offensive way or like, you know, like, you know, I don't want your money. No, of course. I mean, I'll sell it. I write books. I'll sell to anybody. But like, I write this for an audience of people who are going to be familiar with some of the stuff, be unfamiliar with some of the stuff. I try to like, I try to mix like, you know, things that people are more familiar with. Like, so yeah, there will be like some like reference to deals with but then there's going to be some reference to something a little more obscure than these references to this, reference to that. You know, so, so it's kind of like kind of mixed in, right? So as to why like this is here. There's like, also I'm talking about the Kennedy and mine strike. Now I'm talking about this. Now I'm talking about this. Now I'm talking about this. Things you're familiar with, things you're less familiar with. Um, that's, that's, that's typically how I write, but I, I write in a way that's not written to charge up a general audience. I'm writing for people who are typically like kind of Chicano activists or people who are just like, you know, you know working class revolutionary type people. That's who I'm, who I'm writing for. And so I'm selling well in California, Texas, where, where these where these populations are. If you live in the LA metropolitan area, you're talking about an area that's like something like seventy percent quote unquote people of color. I mean, it's, it's like seventy. It's only like thirty percent white. You know, LA itself is only like twenty four percent white. The whole area becomes like the number goes up, but it's still not the majority. So you don't have to. You you can limit your interaction um, with like. You can limit your action, for lack of a you can limit your interaction with white people. It's not that hard out here if you really, if you just, you know, if you just, uh, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it really isn't. And, um, and you can be selective about the people you work with um, because you are going to run into a lot of races. You are going to run into a lot of races and you're going to run into a lot of things. But if in terms of just like sheer numbers and selling books, I mean, like I've been able to sell a lot of books because I wrote it for, for, you know, Chicago, I wrote for, 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 for La Raza, I wrote for, for, you know, like Miente and, and I've been able to sell. To them and there's a lot of them 
mean, there's a lot of them. You're talking about like uh, when you can, when you look at the whole umbrella of people that were falling under the banner of Latinidad, you know, Latinx, and like Latinos. That's like 54 million people. You look at just within that, just within that group, within that chunk, uh, people of Mexican descent, the Mexicanos, the Chicanos. Now you're talking about about 30 to 33, 4 million people, right? That's the size of Canada, right? So that's a huge audience. You know, that's a huge audience. And I'm not going to sell 30 million copies, right? So I'm like, well, I sold to every single a single one of them. Now time is going to sell to everybody else, right? No, I'm not, not going to sell to everybody. So I write specifically for that audience. Um, and many people from, from various uh, other backgrounds, uh, you know, people from, uh, you know, like, you know, African-Americans, uh, uh, Asian-Americans, you know, diff different groups of people, uh, they like it too. You know, white Americans as well, they like it too. Um, but, and that's great. But like, but the, the, the it, it wasn't written, it was written very, at least this book anyways, was written very specifically. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, it, there's a lot of stuff in here about, about just other struggles as well. But it's written, it was written like, most consistently with like, the Chicanos in mind. That was, it was most consistent with, with, that, with that historical experience. And that's what I wanted to write and that's what I did. And that's why I think it's why it's done so well, or relatively speaking, you know? Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that, that's been my experience. Matt, yeah. so to connect to Arizona and, and Texas, did you, did you do readings there? Or what were ways that you connected to those regions specifically? Sorry, just a little bit of a follow up. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Um, I've been doing this for like 12 years uh, now. So like um, they just, they, they're, those circles already know who I am. And so I just connect through social media, I guess, you know, like, hey, my book's out now. And they're like, they're, they got really excited. And that's how I was able to do it. But like, uh, and I've been doing it for a while. And, you know, the, the power of social media connects you to all kinds of people. And like, have you heard of this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And so that's kind of just like, you know, word of mouth, you know. But, uh, but, I've, but I've read a number of times in Texas and Arizona. So engagement is, is a critical thing that Matt just touched on, right? Because the, you know, I, think, I think you had mentioned um, early above, Kelsey, that you're really, you're really interested in the disability crowd as well, right? That, that particular demographic of people. And for me, Twitter is a super powerful medium, right? I mean, it, I have some, some pretty toxic experiences with Twitter, with like literary Twitter in specific, um, but my particular community is really, really strong. And I've used it to learn a lot about black writers and to learn a lot about um, disabled writers and to learn about the lab, that particular literature. Um, and it is, it is an absolute myth that you can just go on Twitter and promote the heck out of yourself and, and make it happen, right? That's not the way it's meant to be used. It is meant to, to be used as a connection and engagement tool. And, you know, I've made a lot of really, a really, a lot of really good friends who are friends now in real life because of um, that particular type of engine, right? And so it's just one of those things where it's super important for you to be able to um, leverage that engagement tool and the power of your engagement. Um, and, um, and that's one way to get noticed across something like state lines and even international lines, right? Um, but in terms of the, the, the question you ask, um, I chose to work in the traditional literary apparatus. Um, and I, I am here partially because I'm a stubborn son of a bitch, you know? I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna make you listen to what I have to say because I'm really good at it, you know? And it, it's just one of those things where if I, can, if I can help somebody to broaden their imagination using this particular medium, um, it's, what I'm, it's what I'm good at. It's where I'm efficient and effective. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick around here for a little while. Uh, Luis and Ronald, do you have answers for this? Yeah, from uh, artists, um, a graphic artist's point of view, um, you know, a writer uses words to um, tell a story and an artist uses drawing pictures to tell a story. So we're all storytellers. You know, we're just using different um, methods, whether you're sculpting or you're painting. And again, you know, my, um, my artistic um, talent that I've been able to utilize, you know, it's, it's, and I'm looking at, um, you know, the success or the excellence of that. And that's by how other people look at my work. You know, you can do a, you can write a, a, a bad story or you can write a bad book or you can uh, go see a bad picture. You can draw a bad, you can draw a bad uh, painting or, pa you know, uh, so, so you know, what I'm looking at is um, how others respond to what I, what I put out, you know, what I draw, what I, um, what I communicate, and um, over the over the years, you know, I, I, my um, pen and ink work um, centers in on uh, uh, 
the African American in the South of the United States, and um, and that, and I'm dealing with, um, I'm drawing people with emotions, and, and emotions, it, it, it's cross culture. You know, whether you're black, you're white, you're Asian, whatever you are, there's happiness, there's sadness, there's there's a range of emotions that are that resonate, whether or not uh, it's you know, one BC or you know three, you know, whatever era, whatever, whatever um, part of the country you're from or world, you know, there's always laughter, you know, there's always these emotions, human emotions. And so that's what I uh, put down in my, um, um, my pen and ink work. And, you know, my, my, and I've got as many people have bought my work who are Caucasians or other races than black. And, when, and my, my subject matter is black people in the South, 1930. Hmm. And, and, and just recently, you know, the, uh, a white lady purchased a piece and she was so proud she got it on a wall. She, she put it on Facebook. I got a run husband hanging on my wall. You know, but it, it's, it's just, it, but it's, it's, it's emotions. You know, I've seen, uh, white people look at my work and stare. And this, this older gentleman, he turned, he turned red in the face. He said, I have to leave because I think I'm gonna embarrass myself. You know, I've had people literally, you know, I've given a piece of work, I present them a piece of work and they, they literally cry. So I, I, you know, I've hidden emotions. And that, and that for me, that's the, um, the key that, you know, I'm doing something right. You know, I'm, I'm writing a good piece of communication. My story is working. Just um, two days ago I, I, uh, on Zoom, the, you know, this professor, um, Dr. Gordon, he gave this elaborate uh, presentation and it was so inspiring and so, but he never cracked a smile. He just went through this and it was so academic and so, and for the, and by the time when he finished up, I said, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, I, I did a picture here. <laughs> I held that up to the, and he, he just, ah! <laughs> he just gets this big belly laugh, you know, that, that you wouldn't expect would come from Dr. Gordon. You know, and I, I, I said, you know, I hit that emotion. You know, he, I, I hit his emotions. And, and, and what I do in my artwork, I, I, I try to, to capture the emotions and, uh, and and people respond to that. And so that, and, and, and uh, just backtracking a little bit about um, role models. Uh, you know, when I was coming up, I wasn't any role models for me, but I said, if I ever get in a position where I can be a role model, I definitely would be. And so I, over my, over my time, I have visited hundreds of, you know, I got a, a nephew that, that can draw, you know, can you come by and talk with him? I got some, you know, black, white, it doesn't matter. You know, I go by and encourage, and, and one of the things that is so disheartening to me, uh, like, you know, what Matt was talking about, uh, all the things that he's been doing and and and, the, and, and things that's, that's happened positive, you know, but it, I know that it takes education and preparation to be where he is and to write the way Shonda writes and all the things that, that are positive, you have to have, you have to be, um, you have to have some type of, of input for educating yourself and, and taking, and I'm not saying you have to be academically, you know, all that um, book learning, but you have to have knowledge of the craft that you're trying to enter in. And when I go by and, and, and talk and try to encourage young people, you know, and I say, you gotta go to school, you gotta get some book learning, you gotta be, you, you gotta, that, that's, that's what you have to do that. And sort of the look on their faces goes from a smile to, I really gotta go to school. You know? <laughs> and, and, you, and you look around your classrooms and you're gonna see, you, you'll see the lack of black young men in the classrooms, and that 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 hurts me. Well, <clears throat> I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, for me, in order to look for kind of like an audience or someone that I could give a message to, I had to go through a search for who I was as a Mexican. 
because I was born in Los Angeles, but I was raised in Mexico. Uh, my mom said, like, I don't want you to be raised as the, the American kids. I was, I was one year old, so I, I, it was like, I, I, there was nothing that I could do. So I moved to Mexico, and I grew up there until I was 14, and then I came here. And I started to seek for this identity of who I was uh, as a Mexican in the U.S. And then I got into this organization called um, uh, Mecha, Mecha, and it's mainly for Chicanos. And I like that Matt said that about that. And I got into it, but I didn't fit in. And I believe this was part of like, kind of like the, the, the collision of two versions of the same culture. Because Chicano is mainly Mexican-American and Mexican is just Mexican. But in order to understand what kind of Mexican I was, I had to, what, what Ron just said, to look through my books, to look through my history of like what I wanted to actually portray about myself. So one time uh, I got into this argument, not kind of like shouting or anything, but I was talking with one of the leaders of that organization. And I was like, it's because I don't see your version of Mexico as my version of Mexico. Like, I don't see it. I, I, I don't, I don't um, identify myself with the things that you do. I haven't, I don't like Selena. I don't, I don't, why, I don't like watching baseball, Los Dodgers. I don't like the art of Frida Kahlo. I respect her as an artist, but I'm not really a fan of her art. Um, what else? I don't listen to the typical, stereotypical uh, Mexican music of it because my dad raised me with the rock version of Mexico. And I was like, how does this connect to what I want to portray? And it was until this argument that I had with one of the leaders of that organization. He said, well, I guess that at the end, he said, well, I guess we fight our own battles. And I was like, that hit me hard because then what, what is my battle, my battle? So I was able to talk in a conference, my first ever conference until now, that's like the biggest thing that had happened in my life. Uh, about Mexican animation in Yucatan, in Mexico, all the way to the south of Mexico. And I was able to talk to Mexican animation students. And I realized the lack of Mexican stories to Mexicans in Mexico. And I'm, I know I'm saying a lot of Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Um, and I was like, then that is my battle. How can I portray stories that can make uh, Mexicans feel proud of who we are. And then I got into this other conversation with other students. And I believe they misunderstood the way that I expressed myself. But um, I said that I didn't want it, Mexican artists to keep on their head that the US was their only option. I didn't like that idea at all. That people in Mexico think that moving to the USA is gonna be like the best thing ever. And I was like, and what can we do to make mm, Mexicans stay on Mexico and create stories over there? So when I was on, on this uh, conference in Yucatan, I talked about this uh, idea that I had on making a story of, you know, in, in animation, most of the time the, the movies goes to kids. Uh, kids are the main audience and stuff like that. And, but I connected through kids in a different way because when my parents passed away, both of them, I uh, had to live on the street for a while. And I was able to meet so many kids in the streets that don't have at least the low class of, of the kids on Mexico. They don't have culture. They don't have music. They don't have anything. And I was like, how different I was to other kids and how sad it is that they don't actually have a story to tell. Because in Mexico, it is really hard to get this kind of stories in the main screen because Mexico don't wanna show this to the rest of the world. They, they just want to sell to the 
to the U.S. They mainly want to show uh, the revolution, the Aztecs. They want to show things that the Americans are going to like. And then I created this story of like how kids on the streets are afraid of their own culture because the only thing that they can afford in their heads is what am I going to eat tomorrow? And that's how I realized what kind of audience I was going to. When, when I was talking with, uh, thankfully right now, I'm able to like uh, work in this idea with so many other um, animation students as well. Um, they also realized that there's so many stories in Mexico that, has to, that have to be told, but the lack of what, inspiration from students uh, of like, where am I gonna, where am I gonna mm, study in Mexico? Like animation, the only thing I know it's Disney or Pixar or all the way to Canada. Like, I don't see that on Mexico. And if you see it, it's really, really hard to get in the industry. So I was like, that is gonna be my audience. That's what I'm gonna be fighting for. That is my battle. The thing that the guy said at the, at the, the leader of the organization, he said like, we fight our own battles. And I was like, well, I guess I found my battle. And as for right now, that's my thing. Like, I wanna remove the mariachi tacos, Frida Kahlo, and everything from the table and bring the other things that people don't wanna see about Mexico and make it look beautiful because it is. Uh, it is hard for people to like it, but I'm sure that when they see the passion that you have for your own work, they're gonna realize that. They're gonna realize, like, I've been missing so much for focusing on things that everyone liked. So yeah, um, kind of like go back a little bit. My dad, uh, he taught me a lot of like Mexican rock history. And in Mexico, I'm not saying like not a lot of Mexicans like Mexican rock or anything, but I believe that was the first, um, the first proof that Mexicans wanted to be as the Americans or as the, as, the, as the Beatles and all that stuff when the whole rock era started to rise up. And the, but there were some that grabbed that talent, that grabbed that idea of creating rock and made it their own version. That's, what, that's why like as for right now, we have like even a lot of encyclopedias, and a lot of books written by Mexicans about Mexican rock. And I was like, how is it possible that in the US or other countries, they even have a lot of encyclopedias or teachers or school or books about animations and the, the animation history on their own countries, but we don't have that in Mexico. And mm -hmm. I believe that was part of why some students didn't see Mexico, I mean, didn't see their own country as an alternative to create stories. They, like as soon as they wanted to draw something, oh my God, I wish one day this makes it into Pixar. It is a good idea, but I'm more into like, how can we give our own people their own stories? So yes, and that's how I realized like where I, what I was going for. Great. Um, we, we have another question uh, from in the chat room. Uh, and it's to each of our speakers. To what degree does your desire to serve your community impact your work? In what ways does it do so? Do you mean our sorry? Do you mean our individual ethnicities, or do you mean our localized community? What what? How are you defining community? That's a good question. Um, Anna, how are you defining community? <laughs> Oh, ethnicity or similar? I, I just want to say, and I'll be really, really quick, but it was, and the last one, I mean, just some, some just let me tell everyone just a really quick practical story. I wanted to get an article about me at Cambridge, right? So here's what I did. I reached out to somebody I knew who used to teach at Cal State Fullerton, who was now teaching at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Canada. He was a really close friend, right? So I took my closest friend and I got him to write something about me from Lakehead University, who I spoke at a couple of years earlier. I took that article, I sent it to someone who was a slightly closer friend uh, or, or slightly less close friend who taught at, to teaching at the University of Sussex. I don't, I know, I, I should say not, not slightly less. I mean, I knew the guy a little bit, but I said, look at this thing. I got this written about me at Lakehead University. Do you think that University of Sussex would be interested in doing something about me? 
then I got that article or I got an interview or something else, a podcast thing. I took that podcast and I sent it to the guy at Cambridge. I'm like, look, we barely know each other, but, but you know, I got this thing at Lincoln University. I got this thing in Sussex. What do you think about doing some kind of interview at, at University of Cambridge? He liked the Sussex and Lincoln thing so much that not only did I get like, not even to get an interview, I got invited to go speak for a week at the University of Cambridge by sociology department, right? So that's how I used social media to get something done. Um, another example of doing things like this is I wanted to, um, at the time, I wanted to set up a reading for myself and this guy, Tongo Wiesen Martin uh, at Beyond Baroque, right? Because I wanted to basically impress Tongo that, look, I can, I can snap my fingers, get a show at Beyond Baroque. That was my intention. It was the 50th anniversary. So it was impossible to book anything. But I know Richard, I know, and I know what Richard wants and what Richard likes. At the same time, I was becoming Greg Powell's poetry tutor, right? So Greg Powell's famous investigative journalist, okay? I know that if I can get Greg Powell to do poetry, Richard will clear the, the schedule, right? I also know that, 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 uh, that Greg's big passion in life is that when he dies, he's going to be remembered as a, as a poet as well as a journalist, right? Okay, so I set up a reading with me, Tongo, and, and Greg at Beyond Baroque because I know Richard will say yes to that. So he sets that up. Greg's happy because now not only is he, he wants to be seen as a legitimate poet, so now he's not just reading with me, he's reading with Tongo. So now he's really excited. Uh, uh, Richard's extremely excited because he gives this long speech about how uh, uh, William Kunstler had uh, read with Allen Ginsberg and how this was similar and blah, blah, blah. So now I got Richard comparing me and Tongo to, to, to Ginsberg and I got him comparing Greg to Kunstler and I got him comparing himself to who knows who. And so everyone's <laughs> really happy. So I created a situation that would not exist, have not existed otherwise, that served multiple ends for multiple purposes. That's the best way to use social media. That's the best way to stay working create situations that would not have happened without you being there and carve yourself a place in the middle of it. That's like really practical advice for anyone of any ethnicity. That, 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 that's how you stay working. That's great. Um, okay, so um, uh, you've had a, you had a couple minutes to think. Uh, does your, uh, to what degree does your desire to serve your community Im impact your work? And what ways does it do so? Maybe Matt. Oh, please go ahead. No, I'm I'm just <laughs> talking again. Um, I've uh, I've you know I, I don't think of um, I don't think of serving my my community individually. I think of um, again that you know that rising tide kind of kind of lifting all boats. But really, my my edict in life is to help people to see things in a way that they may not have seen it before, um, and that usually consists of the majority being reminded that there are other voices around. So I suppose you could think about serving the community in that fashion, right? Just making sure our stories are marginalized. Or, or <laughs> excuse me, look at I bought into the narrative, uh, making sure our works are are normalized. Okay, great. Um, Anybody else have an answer for this? Matt, Matt I know you have, both have an answer and a great one. <laughs> uh, how is, how is this community? I mean, like, uh, well, I don't see myself as an, uh, separate from the community. I don't like an artist has a responsibility to the community or, or any more than I did, you know, like when politically, you know, I view myself as kind of a revolutionary person. I don't see myself as separate from the masses or something like that. I'm not serving the people and I'm not necessarily helping the community. It's, a part, it's, a, it's something I'm a part of, right? So no matter what I do in life, no matter how far I go, I'm always going to have this thing hanging over my head so long as everyone else does, so long as we all have this hanging over our head. So I'm just doing my part uh, of something that I'm a part of, something that I am, um, it's, it's, I, I'm, 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 I'm a soldier in this army, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not outside of it. So in, in how do I write for the community, how I do whatever, it's just, it's just like, I, I'm writing for myself, I'm writing for, uh, you know, uh, potentially, uh, you know, who, who asked this question? Um, Anna. Maria Ruiz or Maria Perez or, who, or Anna. For, <laughs> but as, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm trying my best to do whatever I can for us, you know, for, for, for this collective uh, thing that I'm part of that, 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 that we experience um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Because, um, you know, when I try to write the experiences I have, I try not to really write about things that are just so particular and unique to me that they wouldn't happen to anybody else. Just a weird, just weird, like, very, very, very peculiar things. I try to write about things that I've experienced that likely other people have experienced um, uh, coming from the same background, living in the same time period. And, uh, and, and then I also write about the ways in which we're gonna fight, we're gonna win, and, and, uh, and how the, the, the fight for the future is rooted in, in, our, in our embrace of the past. And then like that is kind of um, what I try to do. Uh, and I try to do it every day out as far as like, how do I write to service the community? It depends on the day. 
You know what I mean? Because it's, it's not, it's, it's like, you know, it's asking like, what struggles are you faced? It depends on which day, you know, like on, on this day, it's a struggle on that day. It was this and on this day it was that it's a, it's a, it's a nine to five for me, you know? So like, it's a, it's not just, there's no one answer. You know, it, it, it really depends on like, it really depends, but, but it, the, the commitment to do that is unwavering. It's unwavering because, uh, you know, you got, you got to, you got to, you got to give your life to something that's bigger than yourself. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I really think that I've kind of made this real clear distinction in my mind and, and how I spend my time and energy, that there are my individual pursuits and the things I hope for, my, for myself, right? So I really do hope that I am, am read after I die. I really do hope that as an artist, I, I'm, I'm thought of as, 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 as highly competent and really good and great. And, you know, it's like, wow, I really love this stuff. I really do hope for that. Um, but the other side is like the, the thing for the community, the thing for the people, you know, thing for you know, the people, the community. And here I said, I don't do that and here I'm doing it. But the thing that, the, the, the thing for us, for, 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 you know, for, for, for the struggle, I mean, like, that's like, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just, you just, you don't, I don't need, it's, it's hard to answer because I don't question it. You just do it. You know what I mean? Do it every day. Do it. So. Yeah. Ron, I, I saw you move back and I think you grabbed a visual aid to help the answer i'm not sure yeah uh, you know for, i think the question you know is talking about uh impact on the on uh on the community and you know, um, you know my community is like the world you know um and when you when you're trying to do things that um that others can re relate to you know because when i'm doing artwork i'm thinking about how are others going to um uh, respond to this, you know, and so it, it, it's something that, that drives me to, to to do my best so that you know, I can get some, hopefully a positive feedback. Um, you know, I've, you know, my book, uh, Quick Sketchy, I wrote this book on Quick Sketchy, something I've been doing for, uh, you know, Quick Sketchy for, for decades. And this book has gone, um, it's in the Asian as well as Chinese market. You know, they they approached my publisher and bought the rights to do this book. So I know it's resonating in different countries, different languages. Um, I illustrated this book, um, Steamboat School. The artwork from this book is in the Society of Illustrators display in New York. So, so I know I'm you know I'm I'm reaching I'm touching some bases and people are responding to the work that I do. Um, you're working for Disney, you know, uh, Beauty and the Beast, you know, best picture nomination when there was no category for, uh, for an Oscar for animated features. It was against live action pictures. So I know what, you know, things I've worked on, things that, you know, they're resonating with the world. You know? So, you know, uh, the community is, you know, my community is, well, how are they resonating, uh, how are they responding to what I'm doing. And so that, that sort of adds fuel to my fire to want to do more, do better. And I think, you know, the, you were, I think the, the question that was asked right from the beginning was, you know, what's your proudest accomplishment? I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still climbing the ladder, you know. It's fantastic. And Shonda, you, you certainly opened me up to, to new aspects of community as well with uh, Black Indian. Um, I was just wondering what your, your answer to this question is. So I, I think of a couple of my, um, my writer folks with this question. Uh, Toni Morrison says that, she said this in this wonderful interview with um, Toni Rose. Uh, she said, I'm not writing for white, the white community and I'm writing for us, but I'm not intentionally excluding the white community. It's just that my, my purview as a black woman is central to my narrative. Mm. And the other thing that she said was, uh, Tony Rose asked her this question of when will you, no, no, my apologies. He, he referred to a question where someone said, when will you get over writing about black people? When will you write something real? And her response was, what, she didn't say ignorant, but what an obtuse question. Why isn't my existence real enough? And why do you have to invalidate my experience as an author, as a writer, as a black woman in America in order to make yourself feel better? 
So for me to answer that question, I'm, I'm not specifically writing for, um, I'm not saying I'm specifically writing for black people or indigenous people. I know I am. I'm writing for me. <laughs> I'm writing for someone who has experienced many, many things in this country that deal with systematic institutional racism, um, anti-blackness, anti-Indianness. And so I know I'm writing for that culture and I'm not particularly writing for white culture, but I know that I'm telling a story that hasn't been told before. Hmm. Um, and when I, when people read my work, they know I'm writing for us, <laughs> you know, they know, but I shouldn't even have to say that, you know, it should be normal. That was something that um, one of the other, other people said, it should be normalized that we get to tell our stories and our narratives and they count. They're, they're a part of narrative period of storytelling period. And that's, that's what I, that's what I'm writing for. Yeah. Okay. Luis, do you have an answer? Yes. Um, I recently, well, it didn't come out recently, but it came out like a couple of years ago. It was a uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse movie. And that was, I was able to go to the panel uh, with a really good friend. Her name is Maffer. And um, we went to this panel to talk with the director, the director of art. And I believe it, she was the producer of it. And I really love that they emphasize on one of the main parts of the movie that said, um, I, I believe one of the characters say like, how can I save the whole world? And the other guy says like, it's not about saving the whole world. It's just about saving one person. And that hit me really hard because in the panel, they say about like what makes you unique and how much you know yourself. And with that, how can you help at least one person at a time? So whenever like a, uh, like a, probably a friend, a, a student or someone that follows me on like my social media, they come to me and they're like, oh man, how can you tell me about my art and stuff like that? I, I love treating people as their own unique individual. Like you're your own person. I'm, I'm going to treat you exactly how I would love to be treated if I was you. So I go deep into like all the, the art that they have and like try to give, I'm not a professional and I believe I'll never call myself professional because as Ron says, like we always keep learning and we always keep moving forward. As Matt said, like it's about going on and going on and what's next, what's next. And if with the knowledge that I have, I'm able to pass that knowledge to other people. It doesn't matter if it's my own ethnicity. I've gotten messages from people that are white, from people that are Indian, for people that are from Puerto Rico, Nicaragua, Ecuador, all those places. And they connected with my art because they said that it looks like the art that it's on their own civilization, like rural civilization, like the streets, the cars, the even the sometimes I really, uh, I found really funny that they, I was able to do kind of like a little comic about um, how streets get coated like by many trash. And they were like, I connected with that comic because that happens on my country as well. And that was pretty much like, how can I say like, it enlightened me in a way of, of that same phrase that it's not about helping the whole world. It's about helping just that one person and if that one person comes to you and they say I really love your book I really love your movie I really love your work I believe like that's when I know that I, that what I'm doing it's great it doesn't matter if it's good enough or bad enough or anything if one person came to me and like say I cried with your book or I I uh how can I say I related with the story on the book or the movie or anything like that uh that brought me into tears. I mean, that's the best feeling ever of helping not only your community, but everyone as their own unique individuals. Okay. Well, that, that brings us back to the end of our hour and a half. Um, I feel like we're just beginning the conversation. I go, <laughs> go for hours and hours and hours. And um, uh, so thank you so much for, for being here with us, uh, all five of you. And uh, 
Can I can I add one thing? Uh, one of the women dropped uh, a link to Brianna Taylor's scholarship in the chat. Mm. So if anyone is interested in donating to her scholarship, um, please do so. It, yeah, before we it's up at the I don't know up at the top. So before we log off, <laughs> Kelsey, I believe that was yours. Would you like to drop it in again? Okay, I will do that. Yeah, I started it. at the Golden West Community College, which has a great nursing program. Um, it's what we did for my sister when she passed. Um, so I just wanted to do that for Brianna. And I think it's close to $2,000 right now. So it's pretty substantial. We're trying to make it a yearly. So anything you can donate is much appreciated. Thank you. I will drop it in the chat. Thank Please you, Kelsey. Me too. I'm interested in doing something for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. This is Thank you all. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you so, so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.